Great. So in addition to that, I wanted to let you all know that in the chat box, there are all the documents from today's presentation. Um, so I will send out the PowerPoint with this recording, so you'll get that. But these are all the supplemental documents that Michelle will mention or talk about in the presentation. You should be able to download them directly from the chat box. If you have any issues with that, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I will uh, send those to you, or Maureen can also send them to you. Uh, her email was in the invitation. All right, and we will get on to our amazing speaker. I'm going to introduce her very briefly. Um, my short introduction does not do her justice, but I'll, I'll do my best. So today we have um, with us Michelle Mullen of the Northeast Regional Children's Advocacy Center. Um, she's a training specialist there and provides training and technical assistance to developing and established CACs and MDTs in the nine Northeastern states, which means she's been all over, she's seen it all, she's a traveling queen, and I'm sure she misses <laughs> her route. <laughs> um, Michelle joined the Northeast Regional CAC in September of 2014, after 17 years with the Norfolk District Attorney's Office, um, which houses the Children's Advocacy Center um, in Massachusetts. Uh, Michelle began as a victim advocate before moving on to being a CAC director and was dedicated to the development of a fully accredited CAC in uh, 2010. Um, prior to working at the DA's office, she also worked with domestic violence survivors. So Michelle has a wealth of knowledge to share with all of us today, and I'm just so looking forward to it. Yay! And I'll hand it over to you, Michelle. Thank you. Um, I can't see, but who's got a cute baby? That's. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to see. Forget the forget the PowerPoint. Um, Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. If people don't mind muting, that'd be great. Um, although I am a baby queen and fan. Um, so thank you for having me. I I got a sense of where some of you were because I asked kind of those questions before we got started. So we don't need to do formal introductions. It just helps me to see where you all are from. Um, and it sounds like you're from all over the state and from CACs and from the sexual assault centers and advocates from all backgrounds. So welcome. And um, Annette knows I can talk about CACs forever. So I will talk real fast for an hour. And certainly um, this is one of my passions because this is how I started my career um, a long time ago in, in Massachusetts. Um, as she said, I am a training specialist for the Northeast Regional CAC, which means I travel around a lot um, and I'm missing all of you right now because I and now I'm just working from home full time and I don't get to go out and about and see different states and programs and people. So I miss that terribly. Um, so look forward to seeing you in person at some point when we can do that in the future. Um, so, you know, I started working with domestic violence survivors and then really the bulk of my career has been with um, child abuse cases as a victim advocate in Massachusetts at a prosecutor's office, working on child abuse cases. In, in our program, we had prosecutor advocates who were involved with the, with the child abuse case from the beginning to end. So we didn't have multiple advocates like your state does. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that and your role with the multiple advocates and how, how that works. I've, I've seen over the years how it's developed. Um, and then have moved on to CAC director of that program and then to this position about five and a half years ago, almost six. So um, uh, I have a PowerPoint that we will go through today, but certainly, you know, this is um, a Zoom call and I, I can see some of you on the boxes, but not all of you. Um, Certainly feel free to ask questions, interrupt. I would much prefer this to be kind of a little interactive. Uh, Annette's gonna help me look at the chat box so that if you wanna put something there to ask a question rather than um, unmute yourself, but do feel comfortable unmuting yourself and asking questions. And I'll try to pause periodically in between my fast talking. Um, so this is our hope for the next hour to just talk about the role of the advocate working at CACs. And I know some of you are there, that's your full-time job, like Nicole in Waterville, um, and then others are backup advocates or work with the sexual assault 
programs, which is great. Your, your state um, may have a lot of advocates working with these programs. And I use that as an example sometimes in my other states that don't have as much support in, in advocacy. Um, so I am very appreciative of, of all that support that the network and um, Mikasa has for the state. A victim advocacy standard for accreditation with National Children's Alliance. I'll just touch upon because some of you need that information more than others. And vicarious trauma and self-care. Again, I could talk a long time about that. And we do specialized training on that. Um, and we can talk about maybe doing some of that in the future with, with your state and with Annette. Um, and then I have lots of resources, some of which Annette attached. Um, but certainly if there's anything that you're looking for that would help your work or anything, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I do consider myself a resource queen and I'm, I'm the one that works on resources for our webpage and with other regionals across the country. So I'm certainly happy to share anything that I have found. Um, so the role of the advocate will kind of just um, jump in as far as working with the CAC. And you know, your advocates who work at the CAC, I know they have different names, but that's what I'm just gonna call them CAC advocates at this point. Really working with families from that um, first encounter with the systems. You, they, you are, I'm saying those in that role and others who are working as backup or supportive in that role. That's kind of the critical link between the family and all the systems. When child abuse allegations are made, all the systems that get involved with child protection, law enforcement, prosecution, the, the CAC, the mental health and supportive services, medical field, there's so many um, people involved, so many agencies involved, that it is completely overwhelming. And if I you know, thought of this of when my kids were young and if this ever was a system I had to go through, I would have not been able to handle it because um, it, it's so confusing. So I always use the language of advocates sometimes are interpreters for these systems, meaning I don't work for child protection, but I know their system and I can talk about it a little bit and answer questions up to a certain point. And then when I need to say, you know, call child protection and ask this certain question. Um, so really, again, your, your work with family starts you know, whether you're setting up the interview or coordinating the, the family to get to the center and then uh, supporting them at the forensic interview and beyond. You are dealing with the crisis of this first kind of encounter with the systems and what families are struggling with from home, whether the, the perpetrator is somebody in the home or in the family or in another outside, um, you know, community member. So you're, you're dealing with families in the height of crisis and it's, it's a challenge. Um, again, I, I've been there for, for years and we'll talk a little bit about different reactions from caregivers because you, you see that. Some are um, you know, in, in crisis and kind of shut down and can't really absorb anything. Others may be hysterical, others may be angry. Um, so you have to be ready to deal with all of these feelings and emotions that families come to the center with. Um, but my highlight is that what advocates are doing through the system, and again, all of your advocates throughout Maine in all of the different um, sexual assault centers and mental health agencies you have is, is to focus on healing. That's what we all want for kids to come out of this experience of working with the CAC and to have some path where they're moving forward towards a healing process. Um, we all know that does not happen overnight. It takes a long time, longer for some than others. And to really be able to help caregivers focus on that path and what you can do as an advocate to help them get there. I say justice because I do want justice and I would want all suspects to be arrested and prosecuted. That does not happen in a majority of our cases, in all my states that I work with. Prosecution of child abuse cases is really difficult. So that justice in the court system is not always what people end up with. But I still call it justice for families if they have been able to support their child, you're able to support the family to get them safe at their, at their you know, homes and communities and to have the reports made with child protection and law enforcement. Um, again, God forbid this, this suspect ever 
um, does something again, there's a record of it, and that uh, community agencies can have some awareness of what's gone on within the MDT. So um, justice doesn't always look like what we see on TV, if that makes sense. Annette, how's my sound? I always sometimes forget to ask that. I can hear you perfectly. So okay. I sometimes I talk with my hands too, and I don't want to make sure, don't want to shuffle anything while I'm talking. You're all good. <laughs> okay. So crisis intervention. I mean, you all are advocates. You all have um, been in this role, some of you for longer than others, and that this is what you're, you're helping these families in the aftermath of a disclosure, which is, you know, probably the most stressful, one of the most stressful times in their lives. So having you all there to be able to walk them through the process and you know your communities, you know what's out there for services, you know who's doing um, trauma-informed work, that you can be able to be that bridge to link them um, to what families need. And, and the needs are different. Sometimes it's housing that you're dealing with because of the, the perpetrators in the home. Other times it may be food issues or school um, you know, things going on in school, whether it's bullying or aftermath of, of something like that. So you really have the, the finger on the pulse of the community and can help families navigate that. Um, and again, as I said before, everybody's experience looks different. And that's some of the, the beauty of our role as advocates is to understand that. That, you know, yes, I've had the hysterical mother and, and rightfully so that, that person is hysterical. The, I have others who don't want to talk to me and just want to do, have their forensic interview, deal with what they're dealing with in front of them and, and not process some of this. And I have to respect that too, even if I want to um, give my thoughts and, and referrals. So it's a challenge. Um, any questions so far or uh, case scenarios that highlight a specific incident that happened within your programs? Will I take a sip of water? No pressure, I can keep talking. Um, so this slide uh, references the field guide to family advocacy, which is in the chat box. And I highly recommend that you download it and if you haven't seen it to take a look at it, I bring it to all the trainings that I do regarding advocacy because it was created by um, CACs in West Virginia and Mississippi, their state chapters. And it really goes through all the components of a family advocate role. And it's written by CAC folks and it's written in the language of, you know, dealing with families at the entry of a forensic interview through the process of um, you know the aftermath of a disclosure and the length of time cases can take if it's going to prosecution. The challenges that we see when cases don't go to prosecution, I would say that's the hardest part of our jobs. Um, and those of you dealing with sexual assault cases of adults and beyond, I, I would guess that's some of your challenge as well. Um, so this guide I particularly like because it is so CAC focused. And it really talks about what, um, as advocates, what we can do for families and to support and reassure them and not, not judge them and not tell them what to do. Um, which, again, you all have advocacy backgrounds and you know that role, but sometimes it's hard when you have a caregiver that um, may want may not want to deal with something like not want to deal with mental health for the child and think they'll just be okay if they don't talk about it. so you know i always had those challenges of when i thought like well mental health might be a good idea and the family saying no they are just not interested in that you know we can provide referrals and provide information for them to make their own decisions um but sometimes it's challenging i think um you know, the other referral that I sometimes had troubles with was the medical exam. You know, again, in Maine, you have Spurwink, specialized medical um, docs and nurse practitioner, Sarah, and they are a wonderful resource. And um, sometimes when I would be talking with families about a medical exam, they wouldn't really understand why a specialized exam is important. I have my pediatrician, every, you know, I'll just go see them. And that's great. I, you know, I'm sure pediatricians are doing a great job but they don't have the background in child sexual abuse cases that 
um, Sarah and the doctors at Spurwing have. So it's always that challenge of wanting to explain that value and, and the importance of a specialized exam without saying you have to go here, but to really kind of explain the difference between them versus a pediatrician or someone else. So that's sometimes a hard place to be in. Um, Trauma-informed, for all of, all of us advocates um, on the call and beyond, I think this is where we have our, our training in being trauma-informed to work with caregivers of all backgrounds and recognizing, I think the most, one of the most, um, oh, did somebody have a question? Um, one of the most significant things that we see in our work is that the impact of trauma and that child abuse cases don't happen in a vacuum usually, that if you're seeing a family present with child abuse allegations, oftentimes there's other things that are going on in that family system that um, they may be dealing with as well, whether it's the own um, trauma and abuse of a caregiver in, from the past, it, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's substance abuse, all of these pieces, um, you know, lead to a family's background and history that impacts how they are dealing with the current situation. And so for you all to be um, acknowledging those um, histories and the different responses. Um, I'm sure many of you have read um, Bessel van der Kolk's book, um, The Body Keeps Score. Uh, if you haven't, I highly recommend it. Really talks about um, the impact and the neuroscience of this. Um, I haven't done a lot of work on that, but I'm fascinated by it. So, really understanding the impact on the brain of past trauma and how it impacts us going forward and how we respond to things, including current um, situations with abuse allegations. Um, cultural considerations, I think this is uh, critical. I got a little, when I was reviewing, I got a little distressed with the slide, thinking about um, the world today and all the challenges that are going on. And I, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit speechless sometimes, which I heard something on the news today of, of a young person saying, the only wrong thing to say is nothing, not to say anything. Anyways, I won't go into that whole discussion um, because it's, it's so overwhelming. Um, and I do wish that as advocates, we can continue to have conversations with our peers and our colleagues to be able to um, deal with what's going on in the world with ourselves, our families, our communities. Um, you know, I know you're all from different parts of the state, so I'm sure there's all kinds of um, things going on. So I just have to um, say I acknowledge that pain and I, I'm think, thinking from my own personal and professional standpoint how I can move forward and try to make an impact because I'm um, trying to figure that out. Um, I think for, for us as advocates in this space of child abuse sexual assault cases that we're looking at um, everything from race and ethnicity to gender, sexual identity, geographic economics. I think, again, Maine is so diverse in geography. I mean, when I think of Aroostook County, I haven't been there yet, but I'm gonna get there. That is just different than Southern Maine. I mean, worlds apart. And what you all are dealing with resources and, and challenges in the rural community are different from, from Portland and York counties. Um, and the same with my state, you know, a lot of it is, is um, densely populated, but we have Western Mass where there's, again, sometimes a scarcity of trauma-informed clinicians. So how we deal with that. Um, and thinking about, you know, um, the LGBTQ community and how we are creating a safe space for um, kids and families. I think one um, CAC that I heard recently had um, pins made for the forensic interviewer, and I think it said their name, like, you know, Sharon, and the pronouns underneath, she, her, hers, on the name tag for the forensic interview. And I thought that, I hadn't ever heard that from any other program. And I really thought that was um, really kind of, you know, impressive. 
although these days we kind of need to have a picture of your forensic interviewer with their face because their face might be covered with masks. Um, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, so thinking about how your CACs, how your um, sexual assault programs kind of incorporate all of these differences in your community. Again, um, immigration status and the fear that people are having these days in our country um, is real and that they may not be reporting to law enforcement or be afraid of involvement as you all see in the field when you're dealing with victims of different backgrounds. So how do we as CACs incorporate this into our work, into the actual physical space, into the staffing, the boards, um, and networking with our community agencies. Um, one of, camera, I work with a lot of states, so sometimes I lose track where my stories are from, but thinking about those community agencies that work with, again, um, Lewiston, that work with the Somalian population. Does your CAC and your centers have connections with them so that they're aware of um, all that the CAC does and all what your advocates do throughout the state um, to recognize and understand that it's um, not to be fearful, that just because you report a child abuse case doesn't mean somebody's going to be deported, somebody's gonna be arrested, and maybe all of those kind of things. What can we do to, um, to deal with the, some of those fears and misconceptions? Um, economics. I think the other challenge that we see is not only the, the lack of resources sometimes in different areas, but lack of ability for families to get to ongoing mental health care. I know, you know, Lori and AMHC, you probably see that, that sometimes um, just getting families to appointments is challenging and with schedules and all that. These days with the telehealth, I don't know if it's been better because A, people are kind of quarantined and, and next they don't have to travel. Um, Lori, can I put you on the spot? You can, and actually I do some mental health treatment, so I think that I can speak to That's that. That's why I'm picking on you. Right, um, so actually I, I've had really good response from my folks um, with telehealth, and because they don't have to worry about how they're gonna get where they need to go. Um, I think where we do see some challenges um, is if their technology isn't really set up so that yeah. they can Fortunately, though, in Maine, um, we're able to do not only telehealth through forums like Zoom, but we can do it over the phone right now just okay. because of COVID concerns. So that has helped remove that barrier. Um, I think with the kids, it's been really easy because kids engage in this way, um, I think, a lot of times more frequently than the adults do. So I think that there may be some differences on the adult side. Yeah. And um, so I'm going to be curious when things go back to normal, whatever that looks like, um, whether telehealth will continue to be an option for more families because of the ability to do it from their home. And again, kids are used to technology. They're Zooming with their friends and Zooming with school and all this other stuff. So um, I'm curious to see how that unfolds in the next several months. Um, but thank you. Any um, questions or thoughts about cultural considerations and uh, things that you're doing for your programs? Oh, I know you guys do lots of good stuff, but we'll keep going. Um, let's see. Okay, so this slide is our victim advocacy flow chart. It, it's very small, so don't worry about looking on the computer screen. It's attached in our victim advocacy guidelines. And it really, um, we set this up because many CACs have multiple advocates. Again, in, in Maine, when I first started working with your programs, I learned about the CAC advocates, the role of the sexual assault center advocates, and prosecutor advocates. So really wanted to try to flush out what each um, advocate did throughout the process. And it, I'm sure it varies in some places, but in general, what I've seen and what we, um, in a lot of places that the family advocate may be involved in the front end of things with the, at the forensic interview, dealing with um, maybe setting up the interview, dealing with um, follow-up referrals, resources, dealing with case review and reporting to, reporting out a case review, what, um, what's the status of the family, how they're doing services and things like that. 
um, the link to the sexual assault advocate is what I've seen. Sometimes they are also at the forensic interview or they are referred to after the FI. Um, is that fair to say? Those of you that are sexual assault advocates, um, any other experiences of how that transition works? And what I've seen mostly is prosecutor advocates get involved with the cases once a decision has made to be charged. So um, they will usually are not at the forensic interview, although again, I've seen both scenarios. But once cases go to case review, there's decisions made about what is gonna happen, um, then the prosecutor advocate gets assigned. The, the most important piece of all of that is how the communication happens among the three advocates about the case and um, how you know you as advocates are communicating and then how the family understands who all the advocates are and what their role is. Again, I know for the sexual assault at center advocates, oftentimes you need a separate release and that kind of information in order to connect, share information, that kind of stuff. Um, so for all, for all your programs to just make sure there's connection um, about those, all those pieces. And the prosecutor advocate, we're going to talk about maybe having a training in the fall and, and including those advocates because I think it's critical, A, for everybody to network, to see um, more about the prosecution, prosecution system. Um, again, some of you may be familiar with the court system in Maine and how how slow things happen, because slow everywhere, um, and how the process goes with cases that go forward to trial or don't plea or to um, an appeal, all that stuff. Some of you may know that language. Others may be newer and not, and so really uh, learning from your prosecutor advocates in your communities, and sometimes there may be just one advocate, one prosecutor advocate, some of them, there may be multiple. So getting to know those folks so that when you're talking with families, and if you know a case is going forward, you can talk about this person and their role in supporting them through the court process. Um, again, a lot of these cases don't go forward for many, many reasons. And so, you know, you as a family advocate, sexual assault advocates, you may be the ones doing all the advocacy, including having those conversations with families about why cases aren't going forward. Um, I think that is definitely a challenge in our job. Um, is that fair to say from all of you that, you know, sometimes dealing with families about child abuse cases or adult sexual assault cases, trying to talk to them about the court process and why things aren't going forward and why it's not like law and order, all of that is very challenging. So I think the question for me when I go to different states and thinking about your CAC and cases that are not going forward in the court system, how, how does that look? You know, again, um, if you're the family advocate, you're working with the case from the beginning, through case review, through follow-ups, you know, whether maybe a couple months or maybe many months. But at some point in there, a decision, usually within that chunk of time, a decision is made if it's going forward or not. And so it varies among counties and states about how that decision about cases going forward, how that decision is made. And, you know, if we were in person, I would have you kind of have a more group discussion about how does that work in your county? Because I, I, again, I've seen some cases where the prosecutor advocate and the prosecutor will reach out to families and talk about going forward and if they want to be involved and, you know, kind of get all of that um, flushed out. Or they may call and say, you know, it's not going forward because of these reasons. Other times it's law enforcement who's just telling a family, we're not going forward because of X, Y, Z. Um, I think those are probably the most relative parties that kind of share that information. But for you as a team um, or as an advocate to kind of have a sense of who's having those conversations, because I think, and again, I say this from experience, sometimes we lost track of cases because an investigation can take a long time. And, you know, the, the police and the DA may be talking about reports and reviewing things and child protection. But if you haven't had a case review recently, you might not know what the outcome is. And so you, that family might not know. Um, again, usually there's some venue and process, whether it's prosecutor or law enforcement. 
but sometimes it varies again. And I, like I said, I say this from experience that I lost track of some cases when you're dealing with large volumes um, or a prosecutor's office that only has one prosecutor, one advocate that has to do every case, not just sexual assault, child abuse cases, which I guess is probably pretty common in some of your areas. Um, so just flushing that out, I think is important. And just building that connection with prosecutor advocates. Again, I think Annette and I have talked about this and um, hopefully in the future we can get all those prosecutors advocates to a training with all of you to build those bridges. And some of you have been there for a long time and know them and it's, it's smooth. Others are new and need to kind of forge those relationships because um, I think it's critical, especially if, you know, it's six months later, the prosecutor advocate is getting the case, you know, your work for the past six months is critical and really important for you to share with that person, with that next advocate, um, as well as sharing with the family what you know about the process and seamlessly transitioning to the prosecutor advocate. Okay, feel free to put questions in the question box if people don't feel like unmuting themselves. Um, okay, here's a sip of water. Standards for accreditation, fun, fun stuff. Um, these are the two tools that are from National Children's Alliance that um, the website is on the bottom here. Essentially, those of you who work for CACs, uh, need to be part of this accreditation process with your CAC directors every five years. And some CACs in Maine are accredited already. Um, some are associate members and some are developing. So um, I am your resource for accreditation because I um, have done site reviews for National Children's Alliance. So I know kind of the process and what site reviewers are looking for and, and kind of the application pieces. Um, I think the important things for, for advocates to know, including um, backup advocates um, for CACs, that you need to have 24 hours of training in nine topics of um, training, which I don't know if I can remember all off the top of my head, but everything from crisis intervention, um, ethics and boundaries, um, the court process, referrals, community, community um, resources, things like that. So um, you need a total of 24 hours in, in those topics, and they can be spread out among one training or multiple trainings. If um, you could use this training one hour, if I gave you a certificate, and this could be an hour towards it because it's covering a lot of what the standards require. Um, I can make certificates if anybody wants them. But um, NRCAC also does two-day trainings on victim advocacy. We were doing them in person, but now we're working on doing an online version, which I will keep you posted on. Um, probably will be in September. We haven't figured out, because we used to do two days where you get 16 hours of training, or 14 or 16 hours. But I don't know if 14 to 16 hours online is a little much, so we might trim it um, and have it be two half day sessions or something like that. So for newer advocates, um, I'll make sure you get flyers through Annette. Um, we haven't finalized the dates yet, but I'm, I'm thinking it's September. So that'll get you some hours. And you know, some of the curriculum talks about some of this that I'm doing in more detail. Um, and again, it's so much better in person because you can do small groups and have conversations. And um, so we're gonna do it online for this point in time, but ultimately we'll be back to doing it in person. Hopefully sometime soon. Caregivers. Um, again, as advocates, this is, in the CAC world, this is your critical role, because usually you're working with a caregiver. You're not working directly with the three-year-old or the 10-year-old. Sometimes teenagers you might um, have direct contact with over the phone or when you're at the interview, but oftentimes your work is with the caregivers with the support of caregivers. Um, you know, hopefully the, the ones who are bringing kids to the center are, um, you know, supportive caregivers, parents, grandparents, foster parents, you know, whoever is, is having custody of that kid and supporting them through the process. Although sometimes you don't know that until you get there for the forensic interview and are having pre and post meetings and getting a sense from the families of what their um, questions are and what their concerns are and, 
if you have any concerns about their support for their child and, and what child protection might need to know. Um, I think we have seen research, you know, for years showing that work with caregivers is the best predictor of success for child abuse victims. Um, you can have, you know, uh, a caregiver that is, you know, supporting the child, getting them the help they need, whether it's mental health, medical, school, everything, anything, um, supporting them through all of those pieces of their journey towards healing that's going to help kids be successful. When they don't have that, we can see it falls apart. Um, and, and I have several stories, but my most, um, the one that sticks out most in my mind is that I had a teenager, must have been 15 or 16 at the time, years and years ago, and she disclosed sexual abuse by her father, her biological father who was in the home. So child protection, removed him, he left the home. She came, did a forensic interview, made a disclosure. We did an investigation and we're, you know, kind of investigating the father and looking to press, pursue charges, the prosecutor's office was. But the mother, who was the caregiver, um, was not supportive of us talking about prosecution, meeting with the child. She wasn't on board with going forward and wouldn't give us access to the teenager. And so in Massachusetts, I assume like in your state, that if you don't have a child victim to present to a trial, you can't go forward. You can't go forward without that person. And at the time, the mother had custody and, and was providing a safe home for the child in that the father was out of the home, there was no contact with the father and the child was safe in child protection's eyes, she was. Um, even though she was in a home where her mother wouldn't let us have access to. So we could not go forward with that case. And it was so hard because I didn't know for sure, but I had a sense the teenager would have cooperated with us and would have gone forward and testified. When she turned 18, she walked into a district courthouse um, without an appointment and just walked in to get a restraining order against her father now that she was 18 and said that she wanted to go forward with the case. So this was several years later, um, and we, I, I met with her, the prosecutor met with her, we went through the process of what it would look like, which, you know, was several years down the road, there were going to be challenges, but this is what we could do, and, it, you know, she was 18, she could sign off on it, and we went forward, and he was found guilty. And, and the mother was, uh, how do I want to say, she did testify, because we called her as a witness, and she testified truthfully what she knew or didn't know. Um, but it was an awkward relationship. Um, but at the t at the second round, I was dealing with the 18 year old and that conversation could happen directly. When she was 16, I couldn't talk to her directly because the mother wouldn't give me access. So it's, it's a challenge across the board. Um, and again, in, in our state, if a, a child or somebody says they don't want to go forward, we usually respect those wishes and we don't force kids to testify. Um, this was a unique situation, like I said, because I didn't feel like we got the accurate information. Um, but that is what my challenging story was. And um, again, I struggled with how to describe this mother um, and, and whether she was unsupportive or whatever language to use. And it was hard because she, the child was safe. She had a roof over her head. She was able to finish high school. She did go into college. She played softball. And so technically the mother was, was you know, pro providing care for her daughter, um, but it was strained and it was a challenge for me to keep some of my feelings about her. You know, I had to say those things behind closed doors because um, I was not happy. But, um, you know, like I said, I was just so impressed with this teenager. And again, um, you know, for those of you who are the, the primary CAC advocate, you know, this is what you're doing on a regular basis of working with the caregiver at the forensic interview, at the follow-up phone calls, after case review, if it's going forward. Um, so you're getting all of these questions about, um, you know, how do I deal with this? And stepping back to the crisis phase is you're really dealing with the most pressing needs about safety and next steps and things that they can do at this point in time before worrying about, um, is she going to have to testify? You know, that question I would oftentimes get at the forensic interview and, and I would have to just step back and say, 
we don't know what's going to happen. Today is the first step, doing the interview. The investigation takes a, takes a, a period of time. Then we'll talk with you, make decisions about going forward. And that does not happen like it does on TV. And it takes a, um, a bit of time. And so for parents at that first appointment and, and that forensic interview, and they want to know, is he going to jail? And is, is he going to be arrested or he or she or whoever? Um, and we can't answer that as advocates. We don't know. Um, and, the, you know, the, the challenge is to um, support the caregiver enough they can be helpful to their child. I think the other challenge I had with caregivers was they are so stressed and upset and distressed. How do we calm them down enough to be um, a supportive parent or caregiver to that child in the home so that they're not, um, you know, breathing, eating, sleeping, breathing the stress of all of this allegation and having it impact every aspect of the kid's life at home. You know, when I would call families, sometimes caregivers would get upset and be, you know, animated on the phone. And if I could hear kids in the background, whether it was the alleged victim or not, I'd be like, you know, let's talk at a different time when you have quiet space and privacy, because I don't want your child, any of the children to hear you getting upset or asking questions about this case and this person. So trying to just set those parameters and guidelines for families, like I know this is stressful and taking over all of your time, energy, and emotion, but when you're at home with the kids, you know, trying to focus on the family and putting pieces back together and doing what you can, uh, not wanting to do things that are just beyond your control. Um, but it's hard because a lot of things change after a disclosure, whether it's a, you know, a family member being leaving the home or whether it's a family member that you no longer see because it's a grandfather or an uncle or a family friend and how to explain that to kids of why you're not seeing this, this um, family or friend any longer. And, you know, yes, because you're told we can make sure that you're safe, but they're still going to make be sad and miss this person. So how to reconcile those conversations and, and recognize both feelings. You still, still may miss a grandparent, even if they were the person who was um, the perpetrator. So acknowledging those feelings, which, which can be conflicting. Um, when will things be back to normal? That's kind of like the question of now, of when are things gonna be normal after COVID? We don't know. Um, so for, for families to talk about the imminent next steps, the things that are happening that you know, what they can control, and that normal is gonna look different. Um, it is a new normal of, you know, your child being safe and doing what they need to do to take care of themselves and move forward, what you need to do to take care of your family, but it's not going to be the same with regard to this person who used to be in your life. Usually it's someone they know, so this person is not going to be in their life anymore and how that's going to look to kids and how it's going to feel. Um, and that is a challenge across the board. I'm looking to see if there's any chats. Okay, caregiver reactions. Um, I think we talked a little bit about this in that, again, caregivers can have a wide range of things and some we understand and some we don't. And their, their own history, background, trauma has an impact on how they might um, respond to a disclosure. But again, you know, denial. Our world is not, um, equipped to deal with disclosures of child sexual abuse. I mean, people do not want to think this happens. Um, even when I tell people what I do for work, sometimes I say child sexual abuse just to put the words out there and, you know, kind of bring up to this, whether it's my relatives or family members, that this stuff happens and people don't like to talk about it. They don't like to think it happens, but it does. And we need to kind of break through some of that denial and minimization and, oh, it didn't happen, um, that kind of stuff. So, and the other piece with caregivers is sometimes you see um, those who then say, oh, you're not going anywhere. You're not going to baseball practice. You're not going to sleepovers at your friend. You're not doing it because they're so scared, rightfully so. But thinking about how you can support families to make decisions um, over time that you know, can give kids a sense of normalcy. You don't want to cut them off socially or emotionally from the world just to keep them in a bubble. Trust me, I think we don't like to keep kids in bubbles. 
um, but how to work through some of that to be not too overprotective so that they can uh, move forward, both the child and the caregiver. I think we've talked about this as far as the responses. And sometimes when we have a caregiver that may not look supportive, um, and it may be because they can't, um, whether it's issues of domestic violence or money, they can't um, have the economics of somebody being kicked out of the house. Thinking of cultural issues and how some communities, they do not talk about this more than others and how that would bring shame upon them. And so looking at all the pieces of why somebody might react that way. And, and for, I think what I say this a lot in trainings is we sometimes as advocates, we need to help educate our team members on this issue because you know we have wonderful law enforcement, wonderful child protection, wonderful partners across the board, but sometimes they may not quite understand that the history of domestic violence may impact a caregiver's decision to believe the child and kick the person out of the house. Sometimes they, you know, they understand economics is an issue, but maybe, you know, they think if it was them, they would kick them out of the house or they would do such and such. So sometimes we have to be that bridge and um, kind of talking with our team members who may have a different uh, opinion about the caregiver. Anybody seen that when team members say things and you're like, eh, that's not exactly what could be happening. Um, so how to say that in a respectful way to kind of educate team members without sounding, um, you know, like you're berating them. Michelle, we have a comment in the chat and it just says mental health issues for the non-offending parent needs to be considered. Yes. So that is the another role of advocates across the board is that your, you know, your client is the child, you're working with the child. Um, that is you know, the, the child abuse victim. However, the caregiver is really who you're on a regular basis in touch with. And so needing to identify what they need um, is critical because if they are having mental health issues that aren't being addressed, they're not gonna be able to support their child. So for you to have community clinicians or within your own agency, at AMHC, to um, provide referrals for the caregivers and knowing that they need to be supported in order to, to help their child through the process, absolutely. And um, again, sometimes we see a lot of disclosures from caregivers of things that happened to them as a child and that influences how they're supporting their kid in that, you know, whether it's a, the thought of, well, it happened to me and I'm fine, so we don't need mental health or, um, you know, going the other direction. So making sure those, those caregivers are connected, absolutely. Um, that's part of the referral system. Thank you. I think we talked about this as far as, um, you know, providing that support and understanding. And even if, you know, we think a kid needs to go to counseling and the mother or caregiver's not providing a referral, you know, we have to accept that. Uh, but knowing that fam, I think all of us advocates across the board, you know, work with families enough to say, if you want any information a week from now or a year from now, or it's, you know, longer than that, that you're always there, like your agencies aren't going anywhere. Um, you know, you're going to be in this advocate role. And if you're not, somebody else will be there so that families always have ability to contact you, I think is critical because I've had that too, you know, people who re decline referrals for mental health. And then when the kids get older, maybe teenagers or other things going on, they will call back and ask for that. So just being able to understand that. What is success? Oh, this could be a whole different um, topic. But, and I think, you know, as, as advocates, all of you probably have these conversations of what do we consider a success in a child abuse, sexual assault case, in getting kids and families through the process, onto a path of healing. If there's a prosecution, Justice may or may not be served if because we know that challenging process. So it's not that we're not looking for the, you know, a guilty verdict and somebody going away for years. You'd like that. Doesn't always happen. So what are the other pieces we focus on with families? Like I said, I would always focus on, you know, your child was so brave to come forward, tell their story, to, you know, to come to the CAC. You were able to get them the help they needed, the medical and the mental health specialized care that's going to help them move forward to be a, um, a productive 
child, teenager, adult, and move forward. And, and we know that if kids don't tell and they don't address the stuff, that causes problems down the road. So that the, the success is you're making an impact, the child is safe and able to move forward. And I do like to, it may be a little bit too much, but I do like to highlight that, you know, there's a report of this person um, at child protection, at the, at the um, DA's office, at the law enforcement, and some of you have small communities. And so your law enforcement are going to know hmm, this was an allegation that didn't go forward, but, you know, eyes are open. Um, so you, you have to just um, support the bravery of the kids in the disclosure process. But it's hard. Case review, um, I think I'll move on because we're running out of time. I told you I could talk forever now. Um, this is our web page that has our victim advocacy guidelines, which are also in the attachment. This is a video we have on our web page, the role of the victim advocate. It is about 15 minutes or so. I think it's a great over, I can say that because I'm in it and I made it. Um, I think it's a nice overview of the role of the advocate talking about some of what we've just been talking about. Um, and that we might need to do a whole nother training on vicarious trauma, which I'm happy to do. I'm happy to do, but we'll just do a quick um, overview of this. So we see all these words. They have different definitions. The bottom line is this work is hard. This work is hard on a regular basis. Forget about during COVID-19 and the challenges that we all have with um, with, with kids who are not in school and reports not being made and like all of that is giving me more vicarious trauma and I'm not even a direct service provider these days, but just some of that. So this work affects us on a regular day and this is even um, tenfold with COVID-19. Oh, I see somebody's comment. Okay, uh, we can work on vicarious trauma. So just a couple resilience um, tips in that you know the most important thing is understanding what it is and what what's happening to you you know i worked for 17 years in a prosecutor's office i had great supervisors they were lawyers um i you know had great colleagues but we never talked about the impact of the work because it really just wasn't talked about you know 17 20 years ago and so when i left and started to kind of learn more about this i sort of was like hey so it really, I reflected a lot on my years and how that impacted me. Um, and, and now it's one of my favorite topics. So we will continue on this. So talk, talking about it, acknowledging it, having agencies understand that it exists and having some ways to um, incorporate discussions and self-care throughout your work, I think is critical. Um, and this is also attached, it's my favorite new document that we created, talking about self-care. And again, if we were in person, I would um, have you fill it out, but you can print it out and fill it out with the different categories of things that you can do to take care of yourself within the physical work, within um, emotional, personal, professional. You know, at, in the professional category, I always say like, do you take a lunch? Do you leave your desk for lunch? Do you walk around the building at lunch? Anything. Um, to just break up that, you know, go, go, go all the time. Or are you running from your car to the hospital to the PCF? You know, so it's, it's however your day is to be able to work in things to kind of take a break and get yourself a little rejuvenation. Because um, if you don't, it's, it takes a toll. It takes a toll on all of us. So it's important to just think about what we can do for ourselves um, and then what organizations can do. I think that's a whole new area that's being discussed that wasn't before um, years ago. And, and I've had, I've heard of some prosecutor's office, including my former one, that have, have like a yoga class or a meditation class that they offer for staff. And I literally almost, I laughed when I heard about my former firm because I said, anytime I ever brought that up, you know, 15, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they were like, what? You know, nobody talked about it back then. So I do see change. Um, I do see more acknowledgement about how hard this work is. Um, and there's a lot of, again, this is self-care, what we can do, but also thinking from the organizational piece, how do we take care of ourselves and our colleagues? And how do we, you know, again, we see a lot of 
sometimes we can see our colleagues who are burnt out or have compassion fatigue and how can we help them through that? Um, you know, they, they may be burnt out, but they can't retire because they're of age or whatever. So how do we help them through a phase of burnout to rejuvenate and things? Not that it's your responsibility, but, you know, having some tips and things to help because that would make your um, work easier if you can kind of support your colleagues to get them um, some help and discussion of resources. Um, so I'm sorry, Annette, that that was super brief, but I think we can just plan another hour one of these and I'm happy to do that. It seems like that's, that's gonna be the thing to do. We'd love that. Yeah, I, um, yes, it, like I said, this could be a whole half day training or a full day. So yes, we can work on that with the network and set it up whenever you want. All right, so I talk really fast and that was a lot of information. Um, any questions or thoughts before we move on today? All right, well, I thank you for all the work that you do. Um, I know all of you have challenging jobs and even more challenging during these times thinking about how to serve clients and families and survivors. So thanks for that. And we will talk about vicarious trauma soon. Thank you for coming, everyone. If you have the chance, please fill out the evaluation that's in the chat box. If not, I will send out the recording and uh, the PowerPoint. So thank you, Michelle. That was wonderful. And we hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Have a great evening. Bye.